Today's talk will be about understanding pesticides presented by Carrie Windbill Rojas. Carrie is the Associate Director for Urban and Community IPM and Area Urban IPM Advisor for Yolo, Solano, and Sacramento counties. As Associate Director, Carrie provides leadership and coordinates communication and educational efforts to address pest issues around homes, structures, landscapes, gardens, schools, and public areas, and engages various clientele who serve these areas. Carrie, please share your slides. Thank you, Elaine. As I bring this up, there we go. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as Elaine and Belinda said, thank you for joining us today. Uh, so I'm going to just jump right in and get to it because there's a lot to cover when we're talking about pesticides. And um, I want to make sure that we can get through everything. So today I will be presenting um, a little bit of information about pesticides as a part of uh, integrated pest management efforts. Um, we'll discuss uh, types of pesticides and active ingredients and what those are. Um, I'm going to show reading a pesticide label and understanding some of the terms. And we'll talk about pesticide toxicity and impacts, especially to people, and then some examples of less toxic pesticides and um, including organic products and how those fit into uh, pesticide categories. So in previous talks, we've, we've um, gone through what integrated pest management is, but I just want to remind all of our participants today at the statewide IPM program, we talk about integrated pest management as a way to uh, control or manage any pests that you might have. And integrated pest management combines um, different kinds of environmentally sound methods and techniques to prevent pests from be becoming a problem either in the house or outside. Um, and we want to do practices that are going to protect the environment and only uh, target the pests that we have determined we need to do something about. Um, and so different methods are used in integrated pest management, which might include planting the right kind of plant or resistant um, plants that are resistant to pests um, or can withstand some pest pressure, using physical controls like, you know, tree trimming or blocking um, pests from uh, getting to a plant or getting indoors, uh, using beneficial insects and organisms called natural enemies, and other good gardening practices. And a lot of times that will be enough for your pest management efforts that you don't need pesticides. However, we realize that pesticides can be a part of integrated pest management. And so we wanna make sure that people are using them appropriately and understanding the impacts to both ourselves as the users and other people that might be around as well as organisms. And of course, we wanna use pesticides that are going to be effective against the pest we're trying to target. So um, often we, we hear this from people, you know, you don't need pesticides at all, but that's, that's fine. Um, people may choose to use pesticides. And so a lot of people don't, they have beautiful gardens and, and um, spaces where they don't use any pesticides. But we do know that people are using pesticides and have little training on them, which is why we share this information because pesticides do range in toxicity some have very little impact to our health or environment, and others can be quite toxic. So we wanna make sure that, that you are understanding that. And I'll talk about organic products today and that organic doesn't necessarily mean that something is non-toxic and what does organic actually mean. Um, and lastly, we don't understand everything um, there is to do with the chemistry of, of pesticides. Uh, and so it's, good to know how to reduce our exposure because it may be found that later something we thought was was safe or non-toxic to us um, we find through studies that it actually has other impacts and so just keeping ourselves um, safe and reducing exposure so first let's define what pesticides are pesticides are um, materials that contain active ingredients. And I will talk about active ingredients. So the active ingredient is the thing that is going to 
um, control or repel or suppress or mitigate the, the pest. Um, and so pesticides are things that are going to um, not necessarily kill a pest, it might just deter it, but they are all kinds of chemicals or substances or materials that are going to control pests, um, unwanted organisms or pests. And um, they include substances and products that may or may not be organic, but anything that's in a pesticide product is some sort of chemical. Even if you want to think of water, water is, you know, H2O, it's made up of, of molecules. And so um, technically speaking, everything is a chemical. Um, and then there are different pesticides that target different organisms. So some of the products that we have um, access to around the home and garden include a few of the pesticides that I'll talk about today. Uh, herbicides are one type of pesticide. And if you think about something, a word that ends with side, pesticide, um, it means to kill. Um, so an herbicide is targeting herbs or plants, right? So herbicides are pesticides, although some people don't think that they are. They most certainly are. There are also insecticides that target insects and um, related organisms. There are fungicides that target fungi, and sometimes the uh, bacteria and viruses get lumped into a fungicide group, um, but there are bactericides and viricides, um, but in general, we, we call them fungicides. There are molluscicides that target mollusks, such as snails and slugs. Um, acaricides, also called miticides, that target mites, and um, rodenticides that target rodents. So I am gonna talk about these um, and give some examples. I do want to uh, let you know that these are just examples. We're not endorsing any products or um, having any favorites with the, the chemical companies that are shown. Um, and so for herbicides, and you know, when we think about a pest, a pest is something that we don't want in our space, um, in our garden, it might be causing damage, it might be unsightly, but weeds are uh, plants that we don't want in an area. Um, they could be something that we just don't like in the lawn that's un, um, aesthetically unpleasing, or it could be something like the poison oak shown at the bottom um, of the left hand side that can cause some, some you know, personal toxicity issues for people who are sensitive to poison oak. So um, for any weeds or undesirable vegetation, there is the category of pesticides named herbicides. And there are many, many different kinds of conventional and organic um, uh, materials that are available uh, for us as consumers to use. Some uh, things like vinegar, 20% um, acetic acid to be more precise, is organically acceptable, but it's still an herbicide. And then of course there's um, glyphosate, 2,4-D, and many kinds of different herbicides available. For insects and mites, there are also products that are readily available in our retail nursery and garden centers that target this, uh, these groups of, of pests. A lot of times insecticides may also have toxicity to mites, but there are some uh, products that are specific um, to mites and other arachnids, since insects and mites are different organisms. Um, and their bodies might behave differently. But a lot of times the insecticides um, will, will have miticidal properties as well. So there are many examples of both conventional and organically acceptable products. Um, and what is listed here under the examples are active ingredients. And I'm gonna talk about active ingredients soon. So in the uh, University of California materials, um, educational resources, we talk about the active ingredient and not necessarily the product name, since there are many, many kinds of, of pesticide products and they may all contain the same active ingredients or similar active ingredients, but with different trade names. And again, I'll, I'll get to the label and what all of this means. But you can see there are some oils and soaps and um, other fun things to say like imidacloprid and um, pyrethrin and permethrin, many things. 
For fungicides and molluscicides, there are also many examples of active ingredients that are contained in these types of products. For fungicides, um, you see oils and soaps there again. There are products that both have uh, fungicidal um, properties, but also uh, insecticidal or miticidal properties. So it really depends on what it is you're trying to control, what kind of product you get. Um, and so there is uh, ma materials like copper and sulfur, which are naturally occurring elements, and then synthetic things like uh, chlorothalonil and other um, uh, examples of active ingredients. For molluscicides, and I will talk about molluscicides towards the end of the uh, talk today, some examples that you may be familiar with are iron phosphate, um, uh, metaldehyde, and a newer sodium ferric EDTA, or also called iron um, EDTA. And so these are just examples of products that contain these active ingredients. For rodents and other vertebrates, um, there is a category of pesticides uh, specific for rodents called rodenticides. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into rodenticides today. We'll have a talk on um, rodent control and um, rodenticides probably next year. And we do have a rodent control um, webinar that is on our YouTube channel that we will uh, share a link with you later um, about that goes into some of the rodenticides. But some examples of active ingredients in rodenticide products include warfarin, diphasinone, chlorofacinone, zinc phosphate, and excuse me, zinc phosphide, and there are others. Rodenticides are only for use on certain rodents, but there are pesticides that are available for repelling other um, vertebrate pests. And they're not rodenticides because a deer or other mammals or um, vertebrates are not rodents. And a lot of these products contain things that are used to repel. So um, whole egg solids that, that smell kind of stinky and sulfury, um, they are meant to repel um, these animals. There's uh, materials that contain a, a pepper extract dried blood, mountain lion urine, and different types of fragrant oils. Um, whether they work or not is a different thing, but these are products that are available for um, repelling vertebrate pests. So that is the categories in, uh, in general. And now I'm going to talk about pesticide selectivity. What kind of pesticide you use will depend on what kind of pest you have. And going back to the the idea of integrated pest management, the number one thing that you should do before applying any kind of pesticide is make sure that you correctly have identified the pest that you're trying to uh, control or manage or mitigate. Um, that's really important or you might be putting pesticides into the environment that are not going to work. So once you have identified the pest or pest that you're trying to, to, um, to manage, that's when you think about what kind of pesticide that you might need if you choose to use a pesticide. So there are two uh, kinds of pesticides. There's selective and there's non-selective. So selective is a pesticide that kills only one kind of organism or a related group. And so it's very specific to that group of pests. So for instance, the lower um, product here that contains Bacillus thuringiensis, which I will talk about that one in uh, a later slide, will target only caterpillars that are feeding on the leaves of the plants, nothing that's inside the fruit because the caterpillar has to <coughs> eat the, uh, the active ingredient product and it won't harm other kinds of um, non-target organisms unless they're caterpillars. So that makes something very selective. So you know you have a caterpillar, you wanna use a product that's only going to affect the caterpillars, right? Something that's broad spectrum or non-selective is going to kill or repel or mitigate a wide range of organisms. So um, as an example, um, a product that might contain the active ing ingredient bifenthrin, which is an insecticide, kills many kinds of insects um, including, you know, some unrelated things, aphids, caterpillars, um, maybe even mites, 
but it can have non-target um, problems with injuring bees, and it could also harm fish and, and other organisms. So the broader um, a pesticide is in what it does control or kill makes it a bit more toxic to the environment, depending on what the pesticide is. So we want to try and, and select things that are going to be selective on the pest that we've identified. Pesticide selectivity also is important um, for other kinds of pesticides, such as herbicides. So when you are thinking of a, of a, a weed or a plant that you don't want in an area, um, you will consider the herbicide to use that might be selective to that kind of, of plant or will it kill all the plants in an area? And it's important to think if you have some desirable plants around, you're going to want to use a selective herbicide instead of something that will harm your undesirable plants as well as the plants that you want. So for instance, this grass be gone has an active ingredient called fluazifop that will target grasses, but not broadleaf plants. And next to it is a product weed whacker that will kill broadleaf plants, but not grasses. And so again, it depends what kind of plant do you have? Is it um, a broadleaf? Is it a grass or is it a sedge? And for weed identification, we also have a webinar that is on our YouTube channel um, that you can go watch after this uh, presentation to go find out about how to identify weeds and um, what categories they're in and why it's important. Um, and so for products that are non-selective, such as this um, Remuda example that has the active ingredient glyphosate, and it is a non-selective herbicide, it's going to um, damage both broadleaf and grasses and maybe sedge as well. Um, and so you want to just know what plant it is you're trying to target before um, applying any kind of herbicide if you choose to. With the way these uh, pesticides work, so for insecticides, they are going to, um, to work by either coming in contact directly with the body of the pest with the insect, or it's going to be part of the plant and it gets fed upon um, by the insect and they actually take it in um, through consumption of the plant. So, a insecticide that is called a contact insecticide is going to be applied to the whole plant and the you have to have good contact of your target pest in order for it to work. There are many kinds of insecticides that work on contact. Um, in fact, most of them do. But an example of a systemic insecticide where the material gets um, either foliarly applied or applied to the roots and then taken up through the system of the plant is uh, something that's called a systemic insecticide. And as the insect feeds on the plant parts, they take in a dose of the insecticide that has been taken in by the plant's um, uh, transpiration um, uh, system program. Uh, an example of that is um, imidacloprid, which is an active ingredient within some common pesticide products. It is a um, neonicotinoid, if um, that rings any bells as people have been talking about them, but that's an example of a systemic insecticide and there are a few others um, as well, but most insecticides are um, contact insecticides. Same thing with herbicides, there's contact versus systemic so contact herbicides are only going to damage the part of the plants that they come in contact with that are susceptible to um, the herbicide. Uh, usually the younger the plant, the more susceptible they are going to be to a contact herbicide because it burns the plant material. If you have a very woody plant or a very mature plant, it may not be damaged much by a contact herbicide. Um, but that is the intention, is that the contact herbicide will burn the plant part that it touches, but it doesn't move through the system of the plant. So materials that move through the system of the plant are called systemic herbicides, 
And so they get sprayed on a plant and the, um, the uh, material goes through all parts of the plant, including the roots, and it is um, uh, transferred, translocated through the plant, and it ends up killing both the above ground parts and um, oftentimes the below ground parts. So there are many examples of contact herbicides, um, and those include a lot of different acids and oils, and I'm going to talk about herbicides a little bit later. but. Um, most of the herbicides that are on the market are contact herbicides. And um, examples of systemic herbicides include glyphosate, uh, 2,4-D, and fluazifop. And there are a few others, but most will be contact herbicides. So when you decide to use a pesticide and you're looking for what to buy, one important aspect is to consider um, how well the, the package um, is understood, um, how easy is it to use, what other materials do you need. But before all of that, you may need to do some homework about how effective the um, active ingredient material might be on your target pest. So again, you want to identify your target pest, and then we have lots of resources on the UCIPM website that I'll show you at the end of the presentation that talks about which active ingredients are going to be um, the best for targeting um, that particular pest. You also want to consider the environmental impacts of the uh, pesticide product. And some of this will be found on the pesticide label. And um, some is known through research and might not be on the label. Uh, you want to find out the impact on bees and the natural enemies or the beneficials. And then what's really important too is the packaging. What products or excuse me, what materials do you need before you leave the store? So the person pictured is holding a concentrate pesticide. So it doesn't have a spray nozzle. It doesn't hook to the, the hose. It, it's a concentrate. So she will have to take that home and mix it and dilute it usually. So do you have all the materials that you need? Do you have the correct measuring tools and bucket and um, what's the dilution rate? Do you need gloves and goggles? So all of those things are really important when you are choosing a pesticide, whether in the store or online. And then how easy is it to understand the directions? Um, how much of the product? Do you need five gallons or do you need just um, a small amount, depending on where you're going to use it? So there's, there's a little bit of homework that you need to do before um, selecting a pesticide and, and um, using it. So in understanding pesticides, it can be challenging, um, which is why we're doing this talk. There's a lot of information on the pesticide labels. And if you've uh, ever looked at a pesticide label, either in the store or once you brought it home, um, there's a great deal of information and they try to squeeze in a lot of, of information for you, the user. And so the writing or the font size is really small but it doesn't mean that it's not important. Um, so on the pesticide label, you're going to find things like the product and the brand name, active ingredients, uh, as I mentioned, are very important. And then a whole bunch of um, hazard or pre precautionary statements. And these are really important for you to pay attention to. Um, all pesticide labels will have these statements and some of it has to do with um, uh, non-target organisms and other statements have to do with uh, human health when exposed to the product. Um, there's other information like uh, the United States Environmental Protection uh, Agency registration, which I will talk about that in a moment too. Information on storage and disposal, which is also important. Um, and uh, the directions for use and where it should be used. So people will say, you know, the label suggests where you should use it and how you should use it. The label is not a suggestion. The label is the law. You are by law supposed to follow the directions and instructions on the label. So if it says to mix up one ounce per gallon, you don't use two ounces of the product per gallon because the recommended rate is all you need and also what is legal. 
Now, I say that this is legal. There's really no pesticide police coming around to your front yard, backyard, and checking what you do. Um, they do this for, for farmers or anybody who has a um, pesticide applicator license. But it is really important for human health and the environment and for the efficacy of the pesticide to use it as directed, just like you would, you know, um, uh, medicine that your, your doctor prescribes, use as directed. And that'll ensure that you are getting good um, uh, efficacy of the pesticide and not using too much, not using too little, um, lots of reasons why you want to use the correct amount. So um, before I go into active ingredients, I want to point out the product and brand name and things on the label to pay attention to. So this example of a label, it's uh, the manufacturer is Garden Safe, but they have many different products, just like the brand name Roundup. Roundup has many, many, many different products within the Roundup line. Garden Safe has many products in their line. Bonite has lots of products. Monterey, there's manufacturers. So the manufacturer is, is the, the company that makes it. But the name of the product, this particular product is fungicide three. That is the name of it. Um, and so <clears throat> these names don't necessarily tell you a whole lot. Uh, there are many fun names for pesticides too called takedown or uh, kills all or something. Those don't necessarily tell you too much about the specifics of the pesticide. This particular one tells us it's a fungicide. So at least we know what kind of pest category it's going to work against but we don't know if it works against all fungi or just certain ones. Um, and you can see fungicide three, it also has insecticidal and miticidal properties, which makes it a broader spectrum material. If all we're trying to control is powdery mildew, maybe we don't need this product. Maybe we choose a product that is not so broad, right? And so it is important to look at the label and consider what it's going to control. And everything that it controls may not be listed on the front of the label. It also might not be shown in the picture on the label. So what you should do before buying a pesticide is open the label that's on the, the back, usually often. It's a little booklet. And um, it is OK. We've checked with our retail store partners for you to open the back of the pesticide to read it before you buy the product because that label that's, that's adhered to the back is going to contain the site information, um, the plants, the, um, the various pests that it will work against. And so it, it is important for you to look at that information before you buy it. And that way you know what, uh, your, your, um, what directions for use, the, the site, should it be used indoors or not? Should it be used on apricots or not? Um, and lots and lots of information. If you are buying a product online, you can look up the product label. All pesticide companies will have um, a posted uh, label and uh, what used to be called the material safety data sheet, or now it's called the um, safety data sheet. All, of, all the pesticide manufacturers will have a label posted so that you can look into this information before you purchase something online as well. And um, uh, like I said, I'm gonna talk about active ingredients and um, toxicity and EPA in um, the next slides coming up. So I did mention active ingredients in earlier slides, but again, the active ingredient is the material that is uh, listed usually on the front of a pesticide product um, sometimes it's, it's elsewhere, but usually on the front, you're going to find in very small writing, the active ingredient. The active ingredient is the chemical, whether synthetic or organic, that um, is going to destroy, damage, kill, repel, mitigate um, a pest, all those words to, to get rid of the pest that we don't want. So the active ingredient must be listed by law on the pesticide label. But all the other things that go into the product, um, the other or inert ingredients don't have to be listed. They are proprietary, meaning um, you know, if you have a recipe and your banana bread is better than everybody else's banana bread, 
you know, sure, it's called banana bread because bananas are the active ingredient, but everything else, you don't have to tell anybody if you don't want to share your recipe. And so the companies have to show what the active ingredient is, but they don't have to list the other ingredients. Now, if a product is not registered by the US EPA, um, and I'll tell you when uh, in a later slide um, how that happens, products that are not registered by the EPA do have to list their other ingredients. Um, and you'll also see the percentage. Sometimes the percentage of the active ingredient is really low. That doesn't mean it's insignificant. It just means that very little of that pesticide, that active ingredient, that compound is needed for control of the target pest. So I wouldn't pay too close attention to the percentage as an insignificant item, um, but they do range. So one product that has permethrin may have a 2.5 and another product has a 5.1. Um, it, it, it does matter, but again, if it's a small, small um, percentage, it doesn't mean that it's um, nothing to worry about, let's say. Okay, um, and then I'm gonna talk about signal words here too and what that means, but first, back to the, the label and um, EPA registration. Most pesticides in the United States are registered by the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, California also has an agency that registers pesticides that are allowed to be used in California. And those um, that is the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. So it's federally registered and it also, every state has their own registration. Um, there are some products that are organically acceptable, which means they are derived from plant materials and they are on a um, federal list of organically acceptable. Um, and I will talk about those too. And I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm going to hurry up here. But there are products that are exempt from registration by the EPA. And they there's a law that um, we call it the 25B product but there is a law that makes some of these exempt. And so you won't find an EPA registration number. Um, and then we have coined um, less toxic pesticides. It's not an official term, but a lot of different um, uh, groups, educational groups use the term as a, you know, a measure of how toxic something is. So on a label, you're going to find the EPA registration number, usually underneath the active ingredient and it just uh, allows you to look up that product if you wanted to find more information. And also if there's any kind of um, problems with it later on, you have that EPA registration number. Um, some products are organically acceptable and have been approved by a third party um, uh, uh, review institute called the Organic Materials Review Institute. I don't really have time to go into that today, but not all organically acceptable products have this institute mark on them uh, because companies have to pay for, for that service. Products that are um, exempt from registration, those 25B products um, are often derived from um, uh, food plants or um, uh, uh, natural products and some are food grade, which means they could be consumed. Never consume a pesticide. I'm just gonna say that now, I don't care what it is don't ever consume something that is used for a pesticide. Um, but they are considered non-toxic to people. They don't require federal or state registration by those two um, entities I mentioned. And many are effective on soft body insects and mites. Some work against fungi, uh, fungi as well, um, or herbicides. And there, many of them are oils, but some are soaps. And I, I do have a list, um, next slide. And some are repellent because you, as you can see, uh, a lot of them come from very fragrant plant sources. Um, and so here's just a small list of some of the active ingredients that are used in a number of these um, 25B products that are exempt from registration. So if you look at a product label and there's no EPA registration number, that is a um, exempt product. So whether it's effective or not is not um, uh, dictated by the EPA, however. Um, so it gives you limited information. So let's talk about toxicity. Uh, in considering a pesticide for something you want to use, you want to have something that's going to be toxic to your targeted pest, but is going to be less toxic to 
the natural enemies, the, the good bugs, if you will, less toxic to the non-targets. And that includes yourself or your pets or your children um, or your desirable plants, right? So toxicity is the ability of a pesticide or any kind of um, chemical compound to injure a living organism. So the measure of toxicity will differ for whatever chemical we are talking about, whether organic or, or not. Exposure is when a person comes in contact with a pesticide or a plant or an organism comes in contact with a pesticide. So something is not toxic if you're not exposed to it, right? And most of our exposure is going to be at the time we are using or applying the pesticide or if you are around when someone is actively applying the pesticide. Um, toxicity also has to do with the dose, the quantity of a pesticide or a compound that the organism is exposed to. And I'll show you a chart in a second that illustrates that better. Um, but it's, it's important to remember that all pesticides are designed to be toxic to some organism, right? They are, they are designed or they are used because they are toxic. So um, all pesticides are should be considered toxic to um, the target organism. Some are more toxic than others, and some you need higher doses than other kinds of pesticides. But that includes organically acceptable pesticides that they are used as pesticides because they're toxic to something and they can still be toxic to non-targets even if they are organic or derived from organic sources. Um, that's important to remember. So how we get exposed to pesticides is through what we call the routes of entry, either getting it on our skin, so dermal exposure, oral exposure, um, consuming it either on purpose or accidentally, breathing it in, um, at the time of application. And all of this is at the time of application when we are going to be at the highest um, uh, situation of exposure. So breathing in the dust or the vapors or um, particulates and getting it splashed into our eyes um, accidentally. These are the routes of entry into our bodies or routes of exposure. On pesticide labels, there is something called the signal word. Signal words indicate the immediate or the acute toxicity to humans from that material. And I will show you where the signal words are in a second, but here are the signal words. It's caution, warning, danger, or danger poison. So caution is the lowest level of toxicity. Um, so it means that the material has a low toxicity to people. This is not talking about um, pests or um, really anything other than mammals. So um, the lowest toxicity to people at a relative um, amount. So it, it really depends on how much of it um, you're exposed to, but something that's relatively non-toxic has a caution um, label, signal word. Something that is more toxic to people has a warning signal word. So it's moderately toxic, but it is more toxic than something that's caution. And it takes less of it to be toxic to you. Um, going up in, in, um, in toxicity is a product that has a danger signal word. Danger means it's highly hazardous and how much of it really depends on the pesticide product. There are products that are used in some of our agricultural situations that are not available to us unlicensed um, people that just one drop of it will kill you. And we don't have any of those uh, available to the general public, um, at least not legally, but you will find on the store shelves products that contain caution or warning or danger. Most of the products that we have access to have caution or warning. There are very few that have danger, but they do exist. And so the signal word tells us the immediate toxicity. It's not gonna have anything to do with long-term health effects like cancer um, that's measured in a different way. But these signal words will let us know immediately on the label um, how toxic it is to the um, applicator, any immediate bystanders. There are some pesticides that don't have any signal words, uh, like the um, 
the products that are exempt from registration because they are considered non-toxic and food grade. So where you're going to find that, again, here, here, here's a label. <clears throat> this is um, uh, just one product out of many. The active ingredient is going to be listed here. And here's what I said about the uh, percentage. It's such a small percentage of this active ingredient, but that's all that's needed to do the job. Um, and so the signal word is going to be found here. So this has a caution signal word, and it'll go into more precautionary statements within the label. Nearly all of the pesticide products will say keep out of reach of children, but so does your toothpaste. So, you know, these are chemicals, so you want to keep them out of reach of, of small children. Um, and so have a look at any of the products for this information, either that you have at the house or before you buy things. So I want to quickly go through some examples of less toxic and organic pesticides. Many of these are very common and some of them are, are um, effective against our target pest and they have um, uh, lower um, environmental and health issues. And so within an IPM program, these are the kinds of pesticide products that the University of California um, includes in our materials as something that you may consider because they're effective and less toxic to non-targets. Um, and so there are a number of less toxic insecticides that are on the market and are very common, many different kinds of manufacturers. So again, I'm not endorsing any one particular um, uh, manufacturer, but there are insecticidal soaps and there are oils. Some of them are plant-based oils, some are petroleum oils. Um, and Bacillus thuringiensis is, is an example of, of a, a less toxic insecticide that I mentioned earlier. Soaps and oils in general as um, insecticides, they are contact insecticides, so they have to have good coverage, good contact of the target pest. And what they do is disrupt the gas exchange because um, insects breathe out from their openings in their bodies. And so having um, a, a uh, insecticidal soap or an oil product used is going to um, have good um, efficacy on many different soft bodied insects. Um, uh, oils are best for woody plants because they, they work better than soaps for, for woody plants. Um, and certain insects like scale insects will be better controlled with oils versus soaps. Now, when I say insecticidal soap or just soaps, I'm not talking about dish soap. I'm not talking about bath soap. These are uh, specially formulated insecticidal or fungicidal, miticidal, herbicidal soaps, all right? So we do not endorse um, making up your own concoction in the house with um, dish soap or you know, garlic juice or anything. These products have been tested, they have been registered in most cases, and they are effective against the pest, and they're also safe for the desired plant. So that's why we, um, we strongly encourage you to use formulated um, pesticide products when you are trying to uh, control your pest instead of something that you mix up in the house that you don't know what the consequences might be. And we do have a good article on that that we can share with you later. Um, types of oils, there's many kinds of oils that are out there. There are petroleum-based oils and petroleum is naturally occurring. Um, so it's um, a lot of times those products are uh, organically acceptable. And then there are many plant-based oils, including those that contain neem or canola oil, cottonseed, or many kinds of uh, fragrant essential oils. Sometimes these are repellents, sometimes they actually um, you know, kill soft-bodied insects. And so there are, are many of these effective products that are uh, out there and less toxic to, um, you know, non-targets and human and environmental health. Uh, some insecticides are derived from my, microbial so sources. And so they can be um, derived from naturally occurring insect pathogens. Bacillus thuringiensis is one type of microbial insecticide that um, different strains of Bt are used for different categories of pests. So I mentioned the caterpillars before, that is a particular strain of Bt. There are other strains that actually target flies. There's another strain that targets um, certain beetles. 
And so you want to make sure you're getting the right product for the right kind of, of um, pest. But how BT works is um, for caterpillars, for instance, they have to actually consume the material because BT works in their, in their stomachs, in their digestive system. And it, um, it harms their digestive system and makes the insect die. But it is non-toxic non to any non-target um, insects or, or humans or wildlife. So it makes it a really good material to use if you have the target organism. There's another microbial insecticide listed here called Sidex. It is a, uh, a virus that's specific to Cydia pulmonella, which is um, a coddling moth. That's the um, scientific name for coddling moth. So this is a virus that targets the coddling moth only. So this is a very selective pesticide that's only gonna work on the coddling moth and no other organisms. There are other lower toxicity insecticides, including spinosad and pyrethrin, not pyrethroids. Pyrethrin is from chrysanthemum flowers. Pyrethroids, um, like bifenthrin and permethrin, those are synthetic versions of pyrethrin. I think I could teach a class just on um, pyrethroids and pyrethrin, but so maybe I will another day. And then azadiractin, which is a different compound from the neem tree. Um, is a um, organically acceptable um, plant derived material. Um, some of these are more toxic to natural enemies than others. So these less toxic materials that I mentioned, BT, oil soaps, and these botanicals, they are either non-toxic to the good bugs, the natural enemies, or they're just moderately toxic and they may not kill them. They might just slow them down. But the more synthetic um, insecticides or the broad spectrum insecticides are more toxic and they persist for longer in the environment. Um, and so we discourage the use of those if there are other materials available for your target pest. And um, this information can be found on the UCIPM website, which I will show shortly. I did talk about herbicides um, already. There's a lot of plant-based oils and there's herbicidal soaps um, and lots of different acids. So there there are increasingly more organic herbicides on the market. Um, myself and some colleagues are doing organic herbicide trials to see how effective and how long lasting um, these materials work against targeted weeds. Uh, but we do know that they work best on smaller plants, not very mature plants. They're not gonna go through the system of the plant. They work on contact and um, they can be useful as part of your IPM pro, uh, program, not just, you know, I don't want to pull out the weeds, I'm just going to spray everything. So again, these are part of all the other integrated pest management practices that you um, use. And corn gluten meal, which some people really like, um, has not been um, found through research to be very effective as a pre-emergent um, um, herbicide. It is, um, yeah, not very useful. Um, molluscicides, just very quickly, iron phosphate is a lower toxic um, compound than metaldehyde. Metaldehyde is what used to be in Cory's slug and snail. Cory's now has um, um, either iron phosphide or um, iron HEDTA, or excuse me, iron EDTA. Um, and so these materials break down into um, harmless materials in the environment and get incorporated into the soil, but they're effective on snails and slugs that eat it. Um, but again, you wanna look at products to make sure that only your target pest is there. So sluggo is iron phosphate, but sluggo plus is iron phosphate plus spinosad. And if you remember from two slides ago, spinosad is an insecticide. So sluggo plus is for snails and slugs and also soil dwelling insects. And so if you're not trying to harm any of the soil dwelling organisms, don't get sluggo plus, get sluggo or something that has iron phosphate in it. Um, so you, you just wanna make sure that you are being selective and not broad spectrum in your pest management unless you need to be. So in sort of closing, um, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions, 
Um, we want to only use pesticides when other non-chemical integrated pest management controls are proving not to be effective and we're continuing to have the pest problem. But always use pesticides in combination with the physical controls and the cultural controls and the biological control. Um, use pesticides carefully and judiciously um, so that you reduce your exposure and non-target exposure and always follow the label instructions, um, the directions for use, wear your personal protective equipment such as gloves and goggles and um, you may need a respirator, it depends on what it is you're using and dispose of them properly at a household hazardous waste site or use up the whole material and triple rinse the material. The University of California publications has information on different types of active ingredients and pesticides that um, will be useful to you when you are making decisions. Um, and as I mentioned, the pesticide disposal. So information on um, all the different pests in California can be found at the UC IPM website, follow the home garden turf and landscape pests. And you'll find information on specific active ingredients, pesticide use, um, hazards to water quality and non-targets. And um, all of this information is incorporated into all of our, our pest specific pages. And then if you need help, besides our website, we have um, printed books that have tables for you to help you diagnose um, what pests you have and find solutions. Your cooperative extension office, your local UC cooperative extension office have advisors and also the UC Master Gardener program can help you find solutions. And um, nearby, a lot of the cooperative extension offices is the um, county ag commissioner where they have biologists who can also help if um, your problem is serious. Thank you for your time and your attention today. 